Manitoba, Canada. Temperatures go down to below minus 50 Celsius, one of the most inhospitable regions of the Earth. As soon as the swamps and marshes are frozen, the ice road season begins. It's the only period of time in which the inhabitants of these isolated areas can be supplied with goods. It's a short period of time. Everything that people need for the course of the whole year must be brought there within two to three months. The problem is, no one knows for exactly how long the deep frozen swamps and lakes will be passable for the 40-ton trucks. Every single trip to the north is a risky ride. Go ahead a little bit. Hot roads, the Canadian ice roads. We're going to offer a little bit of tobacco to the uh, to the, the, the smudge here. We're going to put some of that tobacco in, in our pipe. We're offering this pipe as a way of our uh, acknowledging that you're going to you're going to have a safe trip. I want you to um, just. Uh, Scott Campbell's ancestors belonged to the First Nation, pray, pray the country's your native people. That you feel that you need, that help he is you proud to be one of them. Pray out loud for those things that you, that you want on this journey. And then after that, you, you and I will smoke that pipe. Boy, you've got lots of hair anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Ahead of Scott lies a dangerous trip for which he wants to prepare himself spiritually. I pray to my family. Mom that they are kept safe when I'm on my long journey and to be able to come back home safe. Scott and Chief Calvin conjure up the mystic white buffalo woman, a powerful being and patron of the North American natives. Scott has promised a friend to transport an urgently needed snowmobile across the ice roads up north. With the snowmobile on the back of his truck, he sets off on a long, lonely trip. The white buffalo woman is supposed to accompany and watch over him. Spirituality is connected to traditions and customs and, and to family. Um, and I find that every religion or race has their own beliefs. Um, Native people tend to be very spiritual, very tied to the land. And to me, in my heart, if you don't know where you come from, it's sometimes hard to find direction in life and find out where you're going. His journey begins in the heart of Canada, not far from the border to the USA. Winnipeg, the capital of the province of Manitoba. From here, the route leads almost 1,300 kilometers further north to a little community called God's Lake. Last warnings on the way into wilderness. In wintertime, God's Lake, like many other villages, can only be supplied via the ice roads. The transportation of goods is a tough business. Most transports are organized by the state and are contracted out amongst the road haulers. It's a question of money and speed. Both man and material are extremely under stress. Anyway, 
Every truck that manages to return safely is put to the acid test before being sent out back into the cold. Yu Rowland earned his money already at the age of 15 as a construction worker, building the ice roads. After 30 years in the business, his colleagues call him Polar Bear. I mean, people used to get up there and the truck would break down. And if your truck broke down, in 15 minutes you didn't get it going, you were stranded there. I've had uh, guys freeze to death, freeze their feet, freeze their hands. Uh, and you can't, go, you can't leave your truck because of the wild animals. You get eaten by polar bears, wolves, so you have to stay with the truck and that's how people freeze to death. I mean, it's 60 below up there. That's, uh, it's not a nice place to be with no heat. Vlad Pescott arrived in Canada as a young man with $42 in his pocket. Today, he owns a freight forwarding business. As soon as the first snow falls, he sits on the driver's seat of his 40-ton truck again. This is my baby, you know. I sleep uh, truck, I eat truck, uh, I breathe truck. I mean, if something happens to my truck, uh, it's devastating. It get, can cost me my life. So everything's got to be tipped up. That's why I'm checking every single bolt, every single nut from bumper to bumper. Everything's got to be tipped up. If it's not, it can break down up there. Um, there is no way to pull over and, and fix something. It's minus 40, you know, you freeze to death in half an hour. Departure at dawn. It's minus 30 Celsius. You and Vlad have to go to God's Lake too. Their load, school material and medical goods for the medical clinic. Ahead of them lies several 18-hour days and the constant risk of getting stuck on the road in these icy temperatures. In the beginning, it's only straight ahead on highway number six, heading north. A thousand kilometers from Winnipeg to the little village of Norway House, the first leg of the trip. As a kid, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut or a president. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to be a pilot, but my father, he drove the truck his whole life. So I knew when I was young that that's gonna be my future too. Uh, I was always interested in the truck and I, I got a diesel underneath my fingerprints when I was really young and I guess, you know, once you get a little bit of diesel in your blood, it's really hard to get rid of it. As soon as the road patrol releases the ice roads, the ice truckers are on the road. Every tour means cash. When I first started it, it was uh, real adventurous and it paid good. And of course, you know, I raised my whole family driving the ice roads and everything so I just kept doing now I'm just uh, passionate about it I can't wait to do it every year I can't wait for the ice to come in and I get up there and I get to drive them and I wait for it every year I love the ice roads it gets in your blood and you just keep doing it the loneliness of the northern hemisphere begins just a few kilometers outside the city of Winnipeg Only very rarely do you meet people here. Jim Niedermeyer is one of them. He grew up here. In the summer, he works as a farmer and grows rice up here in northern Canada. During the long winter months, he works as an artist. He used to manufacture mainly furniture, by now, he sees more in wood than simply building material. You have to see what you're going to do in the wood. Uh, the wood has to have a, some kind of 
spirit in it that you have to see it. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You start up the saw and you just see what happens. You'll see it pretty quick. You'll know that you could see something in there. You know, it just, there's an eagle and it's just, you know, the chainsaw is just removing wood. That's all it's doing, but this thing is underneath it. And it's a tool uh, just for removing that wood and exposing that carving. Along the ice road, people know Jim Niedemeyer. The truckers regard his sculptures as symbols of their home country. Well, we have a lot of wood out here, a lot of animals. To me, it's got to be part of Manitoba. You know, it's just uh, showing the creatures that are running out in the forest here. I, I try to bring them back to life in wood. That's my goal, is to bring them to life. In the meantime, Scott has reached the first frozen lakes. The smooth surface is a temptation for speeding. 100 kilometers an hour, like on a highway. It makes you worry sometimes because as you're going across, you can hear the ice cracking. It actually sounds like thunder underneath your vehicle. But uh, as long as you stay in the middle and you're safe and you do the right speed, everything's all good. Where Scott is driving right now is a lake in the summer. The ice roads exist only in wintertime. The through route to northern Manitoba lasts for a few weeks only, and no one knows for exactly how long. Each year in Manitoba alone, more than 2,000 kilometers of ice roads are built through the wilderness. But even in these Arctic temperatures, you can't rely on the great rivers freezing over. Only permanent bridges can help. In the villages of northern Manitoba live mostly members of the First Nation, the indigenous inhabitants of Canada. The state's way of treating them is a dark chapter of Canadian history. Canadian government has just just recently started to deal with with some of these things that went on decades ago, but the after effects of the cultural genocide, forced assimilation, are are seen not only in the big cities but some of the small communities and the reservations throughout Manitoba. When you take a person and you rip out their culture and their traditions and you force them to do some someone else's that is totally alien to them. They lose who they are. They lose, they lose their identity. The people living in the reservations are completely dependent upon state aid and upon the transportation of goods on the ice roads. Scott visits old friends and relatives on each of his tours to the north. Been. He has met up with Lee Cod to go ice fishing. Lee is a Pine Creek Indian and, like Scott, fights for the remembrance of past injustices. What they did is uh, when your kid was five years old, they would come here, take all the kids, all the children, and, and, and then they'll take them and take them to uh, residential schools. And then, uh, then, then, then either Catholic, Presbyterian, I don't know, uh, some kind of denomination, Christian, uh, and they turned them out to uh, be Christianized them and believe in something that they, were, that they weren't. You couldn't speak our language and you weren't allowed to talk to your family members, your siblings, and there was a lot of crying. Lee is trying to make the First Nation members more aware of their traditional way of life. It starts with very practical things. We would never have gloves like this. We'd have like uh, 
uh, uh, leather mitts, you know, that hides. Uh, caribou hide has that fiber, has a hole in it, that it for a good insulation that, he, that runs around this territory here. Lee wants to connect traditional ways of life with modern life. For example, an ice drill can actually be quite helpful if the ice is thicker than a meter. This balance between the past and modern age is not at all easy for many First Nation members. Ice fishing used to be an ordinary part of self-sufficient life for the people up north. Today, it's more or less a way to pass the time. Many First Nation members have drug and alcohol problems. Lee himself had a hard time too. Now he helps young people and is engaged in revitalizing the traditions of the ancestors. It has helped him to get over his own problems as well. No bites, I think all the fish are in school. Yeah. Meanwhile, you and Vlad are still heading up north. Oh, I know that guy. Well, I just passed you. Yeah. I'm going up north, going to St. Therese. Uh, how's the road? Nah, uh, they're not too bad. Once you get up to about 220 there, before you hit more on Hill, you're going to have to slap your chains on. It's pretty slick up there. So basically, same old, same old, eh? Same, same, yeah. Uh, looks pretty good out there. It's, it's never any warmer than minus 25. Like last year, we had eight weeks of minus 60 below. and never got, there wasn't one day that was below minus 40. So, I mean, you get up there, metal breaks at minus 40, breaks right in half. And then you're screwed, you're, you're not getting out of there. So you make, make sure you got a sleeping bag that's good for minus 40. So, I mean, you always got, you got to be prepared. Scott has relatives living alongside the ice road. He wants to stay the night with them, but he isn't going to make it before darkness sets in. The rare trail marks on the frozen lakes are hard to find. They're just simple branches at irregular intervals. And then, the snowfall begins. Scott can only hope it's not one of those infamous snowstorms. A blizzard would destroy all trail marks for good, and the snow masses would make it impossible to continue driving. A whiteout is lurking. The white wall, which races across the open landscape as a snowstorm. The inferno of storm and snow makes all orientation impossible. The best thing to do in a whiteout if you're lost is just stay where you are. A lot of times people will spend hours and hours just walking in circles to the point of exhaustion and then just, that's it. Fortunately, the storm weakens, so Scott can drive on. He wants to make up for lost time. That's when it happens. In a short moment of distraction, he starts to slide and gets stuck. But he's fortunate in his bad luck. Scott is already within radio distance of the next village. Help arrives after a few minutes. Scott's truck is badly stuck in the snow. The second vehicle can't get any grip on the icy track. Finally, the men try to alternately push and pull Scott's truck out of the deep snow. Done. And since everyone knows each other out here, 
a place to sleep is easy to find. Vlad and Yu have almost reached their destination for the day. 800 kilometers north of Winnipeg, they cross the Nelson River on the concrete dam of a hydroelectric power plant. Worldwide, Canada is one of the major producers of hydropowered electricity. This is how the province of Manitoba produces more than 90% of its energy. The truckers drive across the last lake of the day in walking pace. Standing still would be potentially lethal because of dangerous cracks in the ice that might occur. Top speed, five kilometers an hour. There is air between the ice and the water surface. The weight of the passing truck presses the ice down a bit. It freezes underneath, so the cracks are patched. In spite of all the experience, every single crossing of the ice remains a risky business. Vlad and Yu arrive late at their place for the night along the ice road. They have everything they need for the night inside their trucks. How did we do today? Uh, how did we do today? Well, I think we did pretty fair. She's a pretty decent time getting up here to the ice roads. Hey, I'm good. I got my color book all done. So I'll uh, sack her down for the night. What time are you getting up tomorrow morning? Uh, we may as well get up around 6 and hit her, eh? Right. Yeah, that gives me my 13 hours. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, you need all the beauty sleep you can get. <laughs> yeah, you passed, that, you passed on that a long time ago. There is no return for you. I said I'm too ugly to be on TV. Just show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, man. I'll see you in six. Hey, good night. <laughs> okay, good night, man. The second leg stretches from Norway House to God's Lake, almost 300 kilometers across snow, ice, and dangerously hilly terrain. The next day. In the summer, you'd find swamps and lakes, impenetrable moorlands. Neither boat nor truck could pass here. The roads across snow and ice can only be built in wintertime and if it's cold enough. One of the things they do if they find out the ice isn't thick enough is they'll send crews out here um, with big drills that they pull behind a vehicle and they'll drill a hole in the ice and as the auger spins through the ice and it gets into the water, it'll pull water up. It's called flooding the ice so they can actually add inches to the top of the ice to, to make it thick and safe enough. The ice must be at least 1.2 meters thick in order for the 18-wheeler to cross the ice safely. Vlad and you start their journey early too. If all goes well, they'll make the last 300 kilometers to God's Lake before darkness sets in. They are a well-rehearsed team and have gone through a lot together. If I go with you or 
the trip, you know, I feel much more confident. Hill is a great partner to be on these roads. You know, every single trip something happens. I know I can rely on that guy behind me because uh, he knows a lot. Well, me and Vlad, uh, we're business partners and good friends, like best friends. So we get along real good, and uh, when we travel together, there ain't nothing we can't pull off. I mean, uh, it, uh, we know we ain't gonna get stuck in the bush anywhere, and we know uh, we're gonna get anything done that needs to be done. So me and him travel real well together. We uh, know each other pretty fair. It's the beginning of March. The roads are still in good shape considering the time of year. It may get warmer any day. Then the roads will turn into impassable swamps. Vlad and you are in a hurry. They want to drive as many truckloads as possible up north this season. Come on, boys. The ice roads have only existed for the last 50 years. There used to be no vehicles up here in the north. It was the time of the sledge dogs. For Duane Cabaluk, a construction engineer along the ice road, the dogs are just a hobby. His dogs are Alaskan Malamutes, famous for their strength and endurance. They can manage up to 100 kilometers without taking a rest. Up in the north, well, basically, uh, they moved around from place to place wherever the food was, and they brought their families and all their belongings with them, and that's what they used the dogs for. And your dogs back then were basically your home pets, treated well, just like family. And in uh, summer months when they were low on food, your dogs were basically let loose and they fend on their own. That's why the dogs still have a bit of uh, prey instinct to them compared to most dogs. The dogs are not only persevering and tough, they are also capable of defending the freight and their owner against polar bears. Duane practices with his dogs almost every day along the ice roads. He hopes next year they will be ready for their first race. Vlad and you must stop. In spite of all the hurry, it's safety first. There is one kind of accident on the ice roads the truckers are especially afraid of, a jackknife. That's what it's called when the heavy trailer and the truck twist and wedge together. This must be prevented by all means. No. We got about 30 clicks of rough road in front of us. And we're gonna need some added traction because it's really hilly. And we'd load the trails like that. I don't want to end up, I don't want to end up in the ditch or upside down. So uh, putting up chains so I can basically make those hills up there. Well if I don't have the chains, best best case scenario is I just get stuck until somebody pulls me up. Worst case scenario, I start sliding backwards jackknife and basically ended up in a ditch. Truck, trailer, load, you know, uh, we're talking about $300,000 in damages, so I don't want to end up like that. That's why I'm putting all those chains. The ride through the hilly terrain is an act of balance. If you drive too slowly, you lose the momentum and risk sliding backwards. But if you go too fast, you end up in the ditch and block the road. Everything. 
One of Vlad and Yu's colleagues has landed in the ditch and must detach the truck now to clear the way. Without the weight of the trailer, the truck is hardly able to maneuver anymore. There's not much Vlad and you can do here, but help is on its way. Inch by inch, the fully loaded trucks work their way past the damaged truck. It's only later they learn that their colleague had to wait for two days before heavy machinery helped him out of his misery. Anything you learn on a highway, throw it out the window. I mean, uh, basically you can't hit your brakes on the ice. You've got hills up there and everything. You hit the brakes, your load is going by you. If you're gonna hit the brakes, you gotta use your trailer brakes. No, no tractor brakes at all, and uh, you gotta have a big set of nuts. Vlad and you wanna make up for lost time and speed up. But a lack of attention for just a single moment is enough to cause danger on these icy roads. Hey, you are, uh, how far are you? Uh, it looks like I went too fast and uh, I got into the ditch. Uh, I might need to pull. Oh, yeah, I see you now. Fair enough. A piece of ice was sufficient to derail Vlad's truck. And once a truck starts sliding, there's hardly any stopping it. Go ahead a little bit. OK, I'm going to lock everything I got. You just put her in gear and fucking yeah. step on the gear. Yeah, let's try slow if you can, then just start yeah. bumping it. Eh? Yeah. OK. A towing maneuver with 500 horsepower. They got off lightly though, just a slight damage to the bumper. Often enough, the two have experienced that they couldn't continue their journey. They had to hold out for days in their trucks until help arrived from Winnipeg. Many a driver has gone crazy in the loneliness of the north. Last year, a colleague had to be saved by a helicopter. It's truly a dangerous job, but 30,000 people in Manitoba depend on the transportation of goods on the ice roads. For the last part of the trip to God's Lake, the trucks need snow chains. Scott and his light pickup truck are almost there. The snowmobile in the back is still undamaged. The village God's Lake, with its 2,000 inhabitants, lies at the shore of the lake. In summertime, one of the best fishing grounds in Canada. Here, a highlight is awaiting the drivers after a long trip. 
Healy's Lodge. It's the only comfortable lodging in an area of many hundreds of kilometers. Not only the breakfast is legendary. The homely sitting room is a reminder of great hunting and fishing adventures. For decades, owner Goldie Healy has been making sure the travelers feel at home here. Morning, Goldie. Good to see you too. You made it. Yeah, 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 it was a long trip, so it's almost oh. 26 hours, but we made it. Yeah, the road is better this year than most years because we haven't had any melt. Yep. Like it's pretty cold. It's good yeah. though because the road's nice and tight. It's, uh, it was minus 51 this morning, so yeah, everything's yeah. frozen pretty good. So okay. made for some good going. Yes, but I'm gonna let you have your coffee. At Goldie's, practical information as well as tales of the truckers' okay. greatest so deeds nice are exchanged. <laughs> yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Before Scott delivers his freight to a place a few kilometers outside the village, he uses the opportunity to go out on the lake. His old friend Brian, who still goes fishing in the traditional way even in wintertime, has to bring his nets in and has asked Scott for help. Brian has put out the nets between two ice holes a few days ago. If you're doing it the old way with uh, the picks and the chisel, you got to dig a three foot wide hole, probably, you know, three, four feet of ice, and that's a lot of work. But you do what you got to do in the north, so. Basic supplies for the locals comes via the ice roads. But a diverse diet, especially one containing fresh vitamins, can only be achieved by hunting and fishing. Brian fishes mostly for his own needs. He sells the surplus fish in the village. Oh, it's a nice one. Only a few moments after they come out of the water, the fish are already deep frozen, ready to be taken home. An exceptionally yummy dish if fried in the pan. I used to do a lot of hunting and fishing with some of my family and that, and to be back out in the community of God's Lake now to, to help some of my friends now, it felt really good, you know, doing things the way they used to do things and, and knowing that whatever I put into my day with them was going to help his family out. So it was good. It was worth it. I, I really enjoyed it. Vlad and you are still at work, but they too have almost arrived at God's Lake. A few kilometers from their destination, the last great crossing of the lake is waiting for them. A safety distance of 500 meters and walking pace are obligatory. When you come onto the ice, it deflects the ice and makes a wave under you. So all the time you're going across that ice, you're actually deflected, and you've got a big wave pushing in front of you. So now he's got a wave in front of him, and I got a wave in front of me. You don't want my wave to catch up to him, because the wave will hit his back tires, break the ice out, and he'll sink. You got to go slow, steady and slow, respect the ice at all times. Go slow going on, go slow coming off, and keep your spacing between the trucks. Because you're not only gonna like kill yourself, you're gonna kill somebody else if you don't uh, respect the ice. Even after 30 years, the men still hold a great respect for the ice. It's their life insurance on the ice roads. After two days of driving, Vlad and you do not want to lose more time. As soon as they are within radio range, they try to reach their contacts in God's Lake. Hey, you, uh, tell me one more time what's loaded first and what's loaded second. 
Okay, the health unit is at the back, and the admin is at the front. Uh, you're going to bed office, that's, that's the first load. They're going to unload you, and Ella from Health Authority is going to meet you at the bed office and drag you over to the complex and unload the second half. Okay, so is somebody going to marshal us from the corner up here? Yeah, Ella is taking care of it. Okay, come on. Unloading is manual labor. It takes time, especially if you arrive at the wrong time. Today, they are lucky. The helpers arrive quickly and they make good progress. While 40 tons of load are stored box after box, the driver's thoughts are already one step ahead. I mean, the whole season, you know, it's like roller coaster. It's like. Uh a uh, long-lasting marathon, you know, you load and you start thinking about the, the, the trip. Uh, when you get there, you start talking about uh, unloading. When you unload, you start thinking about how you're going to get back. And when you get back, you're thinking about the next load. Because that's the name of the game. you got to get all these loads up here before the ice melts. And you've seen it today. It got down to only minus six. That's too warm for these roads. If that happens for a whole week, we're finished already. The biggest thing I'm looking forward to is getting my paperwork signed and getting back for my next trip. Scott, too, has arrived at his destination. Hey, bud, it's me, Scott. I just made it in. Hey, I'm glad to hear, buddy. How was the trip? That was good. It was good. It was a long trip, but... Uh... I got here and I got the sled on the back. Everything's all fixed up. Right on, yeah. I was beginning to get a little worried. I might have some trouble. No, it was a good trip. I'll, uh, I'll see you shortly. Right on, buddy. I'll be waiting. It was a long trip, but it was... I'm glad it's over. It's almost 30 hours on the road, and the roads are pretty decent. But uh, it's only half over now. I gotta unload this and turn around, and then I gotta head back. In delivering the snowmobile, Scott has completed his mission. Just like you and Vlad, he will now head back as soon as possible. Back across Canada's ice roads, for as long as the ice still carries.